Well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 25, and let's ask God's blessing. Father, we thank you for being able to gather together. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, on, on the East Coast, so affected by this. I, I know our, our son Steve said that uh, in his church, uh, not very many people were able to make it to church this morning. And uh, Father, we would pray for those that are having to... Uh, um, just kind of dig their way out, Carl and Marcia and the Rays and others, and just uh, continue to uh, be glorified through this in some way, we pray. And Father, we pray for us now, and as we open up your word, we pray that you would teach us and apply it to our hearts and lives, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we come to a new chapter in the book of Acts. It's Acts chapter 25, and when we open the chapter, Paul is still in God's waiting room. Um, he has been in a prison in the city of Caesarea, which is on the coast of uh, the land of Israel. Beautiful spot on the Mediterranean, but as beautiful as the place is, um, it would not be the greatest of circumstances to be in a prison waiting and waiting and waiting for two years. And so we've, we've been seeing that. And this whole incident in Paul's life is, is really takes a lot of space in the book of Acts compared to everything else. This is the fourth chapter in a row now when we get to chapter 25 that has dealt with Paul's journey to Jerusalem and his arrest and all of the aftermath with it. And there are three more chapters to come of, of all of this uh, result of this. You would think, I wonder why the Spirit of God inspired these, these seven chapters instead of uh, shortening it a little and giving us more information and insight into the expansion of the church. Well, um, we'll not know the full answer to that down here, but um, I have to assume that there are lessons from, for us to learn as a result of what Paul is going through. And that is why uh, the Spirit of God um, has, has given us this many chapters covering this incident in, in Paul's life. Now, to understand how Paul was able to handle this for these two years and this whole disruption of his life, hold on to Acts 25 and turn back to Psalm, and particularly Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Of course, Paul, uh, growing up all of his life, uh, knew and read the Psalms, and um, I, would, I would assume that Psalm 37 meant a lot to him personally. And uh, when, I, when I see his character and see what he does and so on during these, these chapters and during this time in his life, I can't help but think that part of that came from his love for the Psalms and in particular Psalm 37. And I thought Psalm 37 just, just gives such insight into uh, his, his character and what he would have been thinking during this time. Uh, Psalm 37, David wrote this and in verse 1, fret not yourself because of, of evildoers. Psalm 37, by the way, is an unusual psalm in that it is not addressed to God. Most of the psalms are our praise and thanksgiving and petition to God. Psalm 37 is a little different. It's addressed to people. It's directly telling people what to do. And it just begins with this command to God's people, fret not. Now, fret not uh, means don't get all worked up about it. Stay calm. And uh, as we've seen when we've gone, gone through the last few weeks, it is so easy when you're having to wait to just get all torn up inside. We don't like to wait. But um, the psalmist says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. If anyone had reason to do it, it would have been Paul because the evildoers would be the religious leaders who had brought these false charges against him and they just keep going on and on and on and on and on. And God is saying, don't work yourself up about that, but be calm. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. 
Now this goes on two years and it would, uh, that becomes a big time frame obviously at the time. But when you look at from the standpoint of eternity, um, this is exactly what happened to them. Uh, the evildoers, they faded like grass, they withered like the green herb. Verse 3, trust in the Lord. That's, that's the key part. Paul was trusting in the Lord to work out the results that God wanted to achieve as a result of this waiting, waiting, waiting. And so he said, trust in the Lord and do good. Now, Paul, in prison, doesn't have a whole lot of opportunities, we would think, to do good. But the do good there means do what is pleasing to God. And so in his conversations, he was able to do that, certainly in his prayer life and, and so on. And then the opportunity we saw that God gave him last week to be a witness. We're going to see more this week and so on. And then it says, dwell in the land. And of course, this is written to, uh, to Jewish people. And part of the, the God's promise to them was the land, the land of Israel. And so dwell in the land, trusting God to fulfill his promise to you and befriend faithfulness. Now, different translations translate that differently. It's one of those phrases that's kind of hard to, hard to put exactly into English. But the Hebrew has the idea to feed on God's faithfulness. So I picture Paul, those two years, in that prison when he is so tempted to, to doubt and so tempted to be fretting and so tempted to be uh, just chafing at the bit. But on the other hand, he was able to think about the faithfulness of God to him all those years before. He had all those, those scriptures of the Old Testament of what God had done for his people. And so God is saying, Paul, feed on the faithfulness of God. The same thing, th same thing for us as we are in God's waiting room some, when those times come. Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desire of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light or kind of like with the idea at the dawn and your justice at the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. There's that word wait that Paul is having to do. Don't just wait for the Roman authorities, but you even more than that are to wait on the Lord and um, wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil desires. Well, turn back to, to Acts 25 and what we see in Acts 25 and, and the rest of the book is an outgrowth, I think, of, of that in Paul's life that the psalmist spoke of in Psalm 37. Well, the background, you remember, uh, Paul had gone to Jerusalem. He brought an offering for the suffering Jewish believers that he had collected from the Gentile believers who had the people in Gentile places who had come to salvation. He brought that. He had several reasons for going to Jerusalem. While he was there in the temple, there was a, practically a riot got started. Some of the Jewish leaders had seen him going around Jerusalem with a Gentile named Trophimus. And Trophimus was not with Paul in the temple, but they just started this rumor. Hey, this guy Paul is in the temple compound in the area that only Jewish people are allowed in, and he has a Gentile there. Again, that was totally fabricated, but that was the rumor that they started, created an uproar, created practically a, a riot. The Roman soldiers come down from the fortress, which was next door for, to the temple, and they try to stop this whole thing. And that started this whole period of two years where Paul has been in custody of the Romans. And uh, the Roman uh, centurion decides he needs to send Paul to the capital, the Roman capital of Israel, which was not Jerusalem, but was Caesarea on the coast. And there was a plot by the Jews to kill Paul, but he gets him down there and so on. And then the Roman governor Here's his case. And he, there's really no, no charges that, that 
Paul, there's any evidence that Paul is guilty of. There's really no, no legal reason to keep him in custody. But the governor, uh, he, he wants to, to, to get favor with the, with the Jewish leaders and he doesn't uh, want the big ruckus that would come if he lets Paul out. So he keeps Paul and just keeps putting off two things. We saw last week, he put off trusting Christ as a savior because Paul has shared the gospel with him, but he also puts off making a decision on this case. And so there Paul is in God's waiting room uh, for two years, but he never, ever became uh, resentful. Well, let's look then tonight at what happened, beginning with number one, continuing delay. Go back to the verse we ended at last week, the last verse of chapter 24. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the, the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison for two years. Now, we pick up the story in verse 25, and lo and behold, there are new plans to kill Paul. This is two years later, and now a new plot is hatched. Verse 1, now three days after Festus, that's the new governor, new governor, had arrived in the province. History says that Festus was a better governor, better administrator than Felix, his predecessor. Uh, he wasn't the procrastinator that Festus was. And Josephus, the great Jewish historian, uh, speaks, speaks very highly of him. And so he's arrived in Caesarea, and he's arrived in the province, and he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. So the Roman governors at certain times of the year would go up to Jerusalem, which of course was the Jewish capital of the land. But the governors tried to stay away from Jerusalem as much as they could. They didn't like the religious fervor in Jerusalem and so on. And, and, and so, but he, he needs to go to Jerusalem. If he's going to be a good ruler of, of the land of Judea, he needs to understand the culture, uh, the Jewish religion, and so on. And to do that, he needs to go to Jerusalem. Now, he's not going to make the same mistake that his famous predecessor, not his immediate predecessor, but his most famous predecessor, Pilate did. Uh, when, when you study Pilate in the New Testament, and you study the history of that man, one of the things you learn, New Testament doesn't mention it, but it's in Josephus and other places, and it's often mentioned to understand this man, Pilate. When Pilate arrived as the governor, and he made this trek to Jerusalem, his soldiers carried the Roman standards. Those were poles, and they had a banner or something like that on them, and they had an image of Caesar. And he should have known that that would provoke the Jews because it's, it's bringing an image into the city of Jerusalem, into the area of the temple. And the Jews were very serious about uh, the Ten Commandments, and in particular, not to make an, an image of God. And so they looked at Caesar as God, so here's an Im the image of a God. Well, the, the Jews uh, just absolutely went ballistic at that, and uh, Pilate had a terrible beginning as governor that he really never got over. And there was just tension, constant tension, all the way up to the time of, of the trial of Christ. Well, this governor doesn't do anything like that. Uh, so uh, he goes up uh, to Jerusalem trying to make friends and so on. And in verse 2, and the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. So here it is two years later. You would have thought that they had forgotten about Paul, but not at all. And so here's the new governor, and they get to him in Jerusalem, and they lay it out, and they say, we have things against this man, and this man is an enemy to Rome, and so on, and you've got to bring him here, and you've got to bring him to justice, and so on. And maybe they were afraid that Festus would do what some new governors did, and that is they dismissed all the cases that were pending like this and just freed everyone and start afresh. 
And uh, so they may have been afraid of something like that, the Paul that he's going to release Paul. So they're right on his case uh, on that. And they laid out their case against Paul. And in verse 3, asking as a favor against Paul. Now they're not interested in justice for Paul. They have their minds made up and they want to get, get rid of Paul. So they are asking the governor not to make a good, wise, judicial decision, but they are asking him, hey, do this as a favor uh, to us, that he summon him, that is Paul, to Jerusalem. So remember, Paul's back in the jail in Caesarea. The governor has gone from Caesarea to Jerusalem, and they're saying, would you please bring Paul back to Jerusalem? But look, look at the next phrase. And they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Sound familiar? Back in chapter 23, verses 12 to 22, there was a plot of an ambush against Paul on his journey from Jerusalem to Caesarea two years before. And that's a, that's a dangerous road and lots of places for bandits to hide out and attack travelers and so on. And they had it all planned. Now they've got it planned again. All they need is for the governor to agree to take Paul to Jerusalem. Well, um, look at uh, verse 4. Festus replied, and uh, Felix had probably told him about Paul and about the plot when Paul came to Caesarea. I just kind of have to presume that. And so Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea, and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So Festus, the governor, says, and I'm going back to Caesarea, and Paul's going to stay there, and so on. So here's Festus' idea, verse 5. So said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me. Uh, so Festus does not agree to their request. Why? Well, we're not told what was going through his mind, but we know beyond that, we know that God is at work. The book of Proverbs talks about as, as people turn channels of water, like where you have irrigation and you want the water to go into this end, irrigation canal instead of that one, you go and you turn some valves and so on. And, and people uh, in, in agricultural areas like that can turn the water to go wherever they want. The book of Proverbs uh, talks about that's how God is with kings and people that are in, in authority. God is the ruler and uh, he's, he's moving them and making decisions. But God is behind that. And so I think that's, that's the answer to why um, the governor made the decision that he did. He didn't know it, but God was behind the scenes directing him uh, in this because God has, has made a promise to Paul that back in chapter 23, verse 11, that Paul is not going to be killed here, but that he will get to Jerusalem, to, to, to Rome, excuse me, to Rome, and he will be a witness for him. And if Paul is, had been killed here, uh, the very, very truthfulness of God would have been uh, absolutely uh, destroyed, and God would not be God. So it's, it's uh, building up what's going to happen. So uh, he said, let them, the, let the, uh, in, in verse 5, so said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me. And if there is anything wrong the man with the man, let, him, let them bring charges against him. So he turns the tables on them and he says, no, you come to Caesarea and we'll take care of it in Caesarea. Well, then we have number three. Now there's false accusations, as there have been all along. Look at verse 6. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days. So that's the governor looking things over in Jerusalem. You can be sure he would have visited the temple. That is, as far as a Gentile could go in the temple. He would have met with the religious leaders and so on. Uh, would have been a big time of, of education for him. And uh, he would have heard the high priest's version of everything that they had against Paul. 
And um, so, but after eight or 10 days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day, he took his seat on the tribunal. That would be an official uh, a seat, not a throne so much as a judge's seat. And that was where he made official decrees in his job as the governor of Rome or a governor of, of the Judea. And uh, he would also be trying cases like Paul's and, and so on. All of this is a very official place, the tribunal. So he sits on the tribunal and he ordered Paul to be brought. Now, what we're going to see beginning here, it's kind of interesting to think about uh, how did Luke, now we know that of course that Luke was inspired by the Holy Spirit and certainly the Holy Spirit can, can just give Luke uh, just uh, amazing information that um, he didn't have to dig around for. But on the other hand, Luke is a, a good historian, Luke uh, who wrote the book of Acts is a good historian. And in his introduction to the book of Luke and Acts, he, give, he lets you know that he, he researched these things. Well, it's interesting that in modern times, a lot of archaeology has been, has been digging around in the city of Caesarea. It's an amazing place to visit when you go to Israel, uh, visiting sites having to do with the Bible. And the archaeologists have dug so much up. Well, they've also uncovered um, over 200 different pieces of papyrus, which happened to be from the archives of the Roman government in Caesarea, ta giving information on court cases. And they have speeches, they have summaries of speeches that were made in, in court cases before the governor. Now, of the 250 that have been found, none of them directly relate to Paul. But that probably just scratches the surface of what they had. And so it's interesting to think of, 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 of Luke, after these events happened, getting to get into those archives and, and read these. And some of the summaries of what was said at a trial are the same size, roughly, of what we're going to have in the book of Acts. Fits perfectly as what, what we see in, in history of what happened there. So anyway... Um, it, it continues in verse 7. Uh, when he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Now the three charges that they brought to Felix were, were really the redone charges that had been brought to Festus. The first one was sedition. That is, that he had stirred up a Jewish revolution against Rome. Now, that was back in chapter 24, verses 5 and 6. No proof, no evidence to that. Paul did not do that. Second charge was charge of heresy, that he was a ringleader of a sect of the Nazarenes. And sect is used in a negative sense. We sometimes in America use the term sect of any small religious group. No judgment on it concerning heresy. But when it's, when it's used here in the New Testament, it is a, a word that connotes someone promoting heresy. And so they, they said that he was promoting heresy that was taught by these Nazarenes. Well, the heresy would be that Jesus is the Messiah. That was in chapter 24, verse 5. And then lastly, the third charge was that he had profaned the temple. And that was in chapter 24, verse 6. So uh, they're giving here a rehash of those three uh, charges. And um, so... Uh, they bring the, many, the charges against him that they could not prove. They can't prove it. So they are looking for the governor to give them a favor. Not justice, but a favor. To overlook. If he would just overlook the evidence and, uh, and get rid of Paul for them. Whether that be execution or who, who knows. Now... The irony of that, as we have seen before, of these charges, is that 
now that Paul is a believer in Messiah Jesus, he loves the law of God more than he ever did. He loves the temple more than he did, ever did, and so on. He's, he's a, a, you could really say, a better Jew than he ever was. And that's the same today when a Jewish person comes to faith in Christ. They, be, they become an even greater lover of, of their Hebrew Bible and, and, and so on. Well, uh, this, this is where all this is going. So, verse 8. And Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed any offense. He has a good conscience. He is able to say, my conscience bears me witness that I have not broken any laws. I have not done any things, uh, any of these things. It's wonderful to be able to speak from truly a good conscience. And, uh, and that's what he's able to do here. Well, in verse 9, we then have number 4. On top of the death threat, on top of the uh, false accusations, now there's also unfair exploitation. That is, both governors, Felix and Festus, used Paul to try to gain favor with the Jewish people, even if it would mean harm to Paul. Look at verse 9. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor. So he's just started as governor. He wants to get a good start. He wants to be on the good side of them. So he says, you know, um, I, I, I see something I might be able to do here to, to, to get on their good side. And... Um, and so on. So to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? Well, the only thing he is, is giving in any way to Paul is that if he goes to Jerusalem, He's going to have a trial done by Paul, or excuse me, by, by the governor rather than the Jewish religious leaders. And so that would mean uh, he had a greater chance of justice. But, um, but that's the only, only good thing that he is offering Paul. So um, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem? Verse 10, Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal. In other words, every governor was a representative of Caesar and could make decisions on behalf of Caesar. Caesarea is the Roman seat of government for the province of Judea. And so Paul is saying, you're the Roman governor. This is the seat of government. Let's have the trial here. No, I do not choose to go to Jerusalem. So... Uh, Festus is losing out on his hope to gain some favor. And uh, so, verse 10, and I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. Verse 11, if then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. So here comes the big words. I appeal to Caesar. Now Paul is unusual in that he is a Roman citizen, excuse me, a Jewish person who has Roman citizenship. Most Jews did not. Most Jews were, they were a conquered ter territory and so on. We talked about this uh, earlier in the book when this came out. As far as we know, uh, and, and Paul mentions that it was because of his father was given citizenship. We don't know any details about that. Many have guessed that his father served in the military and did something brave and re was rewarded with Roman citizenship and therefore it was passed on to Paul. But because he's a citizen, he has the right to appeal to Caesar. And um, Paul, you have to wonder, is he possibly sensing that this is going to be the means by which God is going to get Paul to Rome to fulfill that answer. And on top of that, the Roman government's going to pay the bill for, for, the, for, for the cruise 
on the ship, well, cruise isn't the best word, but um, going on that ship uh, to Rome, which becomes a big, interesting event in the next, coming up in Acts. Well, verse 12, then Festus, when he had conferred with his council, answered, to Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Well, great, except that could be dangerous too. You know who the Caesar was at that time? It was Nero. Now, Nero was not exactly a paragon of virtue. Nero was a very evil man. Uh, history says, for instance, that he killed his mother, his own mother, to please his lover. He killed his lover by kicking her in the stomach when she was pregnant. Uh, at another point, he wanted to marry his adopted sister, and when she refused, he killed her. I mean, this guy uh, is already a tyrant, and he's just going to get worse. He's going to get to the point, he's not doing it now, but he's going to get to the point where he delights in killing Christians. And you read stories in church history of him killing Christians and, 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 and as they are dying, they're on, they're, they're, they're on poles and they're set on fire, kerosene's put on them and they're put on fire to light uh, Nero's gardens and so on. And, and uh, so appealing to, to Nero doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get justice. But this is going to be the means to get Paul to Rome where God's going to use him as a witness in high places. Well, now Festus has a problem. He has to send Paul to Rome, but he has to send a report to the Caesar explaining why this guy should be tried by Caesar. Not just because he asked to, but... There, there must be some serious charges here that would, would, would prompt this. And really, there's nothing Festus can write at this point. He realizes, I don't know what I can put in this report, and this isn't going to look very good on me if he gets to, to Rome, and the first case that I send to Rome is, is so bizarre and, and so unworthy of the emperor's time, uh, they're going to think, what kind of incompetent governor am I? And all of a sudden, arriving on the scene is a fellow governor of another part of what was the land of Israel till it was divided up after the death of Herod the Great. This is going to be one of the Herods. His name is Herod Agrippa. And his wife, Bernice, very interesting woman in her own right, they arrive in Caesarea. Maybe they can help poor Festus. And that's where we will pick up the story next week. But God uh, uses Paul to, to really uh, um, present the gospel and salvation to them as well. Well, you may not be in a prison situation like Paul was for two years, but you may be in a, in a, in a waiting room, a waiting situation where you feel like crying out, God, get me out of here. But just as Paul fret, fretted not and trusted in the Lord and waited on him, as it says in Psalm 37, so should we. And God is faithful. Let's pray. Father, how we do thank you for your work in the midst of this. It must have been very frustrating to Paul, those two years. And yet he's able to rest in you, fret not, and trust you. And we pray that for us as well. And Father, we know that um, these chapters in Acts are here for a purpose. You have lessons for us to learn, and we pray that we would learn them. We thank you for the fellowship we have, and we thank you for the food that, that's here, and we pray your blessing as we share together, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.